Holy Spirit with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, out of your love and mercy, you breathe into the dust of the breath of life, creating us to serve you and our neighbors. Call forth our prayers and acts of kindness, and strengthen us to face our mortality with confidence in the mercy of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord, who lives and reigns with you. Thank you. 
The second lesson this evening is from the fifth and sixth chapters of 2 Corinthians. So we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making an appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, God made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Christ we might become the righteousness of God. As we work together with Christ, we urge you not to accept the grace of God in vain. For God says, at an acceptable time, I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation, I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way, through great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger. By purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute. We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet are well known, as dying and see, we are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and in the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, Put oil on your head and wash your face, so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. 
For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to the Lord Christ. If you were to show up at my home unannounced, which I would not recommend, you would likely find torn pieces of cardboard, paper, and Kleenex strewn upon the floor. The work of disobedient dogs had their fun. You would also likely find coloring pencils, scraps of yarn, half-written stories, and friendship bracelet beads littered across the carpet. The work of creative but undisciplined children. You would probably discover sacks of mail and yesterday's dirty dishes piled on a tabletop, as well as an entire room of unsorted socks in progress of finding their match. The unfinished work of parents whose priorities don't include finishing all that work at this moment. You would come to learn if you didn't know it already that your pastor isn't the tiniest person in the world. But, if you were to give advance notice of your job by, you would likely find a moderately picked up home, orderly, seemingly well kept, as long as you don't look in the myriad of places we stash things away to keep from your noticing. For some reason, although our home definitely has a, let's call it a, a well-lived-in vibe, we feel the need to keep up appearances for visitors. What is that all about? It could be about hospitality and creating a good feeling, uncluttered space for guests. It could be about eliminating safety dangers so a visitor doesn't slip on a scrap or something and end up in the emergency room. More than likely, however, the actual reason is that it is all about perception, about appearing to have it all together, about impressing a visitor with some semblance of spotlessness, about avoiding shame and embarrassment at our usual unkempt conditions. I think that same dynamic is at work around here too. Ever since the flooding here at church, things have been out of their usual order with, with shelves scattered across the back. The light fixture is still out laying on the table. The children's playground area is all out of sorts. And although I am not very tidy, I feel some pressure to avoid embarrassment, to keep up appearances, thinking about what do others think about this mess, rather than considering that the mess might not be something to be avoided but embraced or contemplated. We spick and spanify in order to be seen by others in a certain way. In our Ash Wednesday Gospel reading, Jesus addresses how religious people do the same thing with their piety. Alms are given to the poor with a trumpet blast in order to catch the attention of others. Prayers are prayed on the street corner in order that the prayer might be recognized. Those that fast distort their faces to accentuate their agony so others might see their sacrifice. Religious practice, Jesus knows, carries with it a desire to be noticed, to appear as a visibly upright personage dedicated to God. This Jesus names as hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is a term that is bandied about. It's hurled at our enemies so often that we no longer know what it means. In Jesus' world, the word hypocrisy is the language of the theater. Actors in production would have various masks at hand to assist them in playing different characters. As is the case with all acting, there is a difference between the actor and the role that they are playing. In this case, the use of a mask helps the audience to discern which role they are currently in. They become hypocrites as they reveal a different face with each character they are trying to portray. 
So often we falsely ascribe that word to someone who acts in a way that contradicts their values, like when an oil pipeline protester drives a gasoline-powered vehicle to a protest site, or when a vegetarian gives in to their desire for a slab of steak. These misalignments of values and action are more of a consequence of us all living in a very complicated world. These misalignments reveal the disconnect between our aspirations and hopes and our current reality. Still, these misalignments are treated most uncharitably, weaponized, more often than not, to assassinate people's characters, calling them out as hypocrites, does that trick. This typical decrying someone as a hypocrite, though, doesn't quite fit the playbill. Hypocrisy is more about acting a role, putting on a face, hiding the person they know themselves to be and presenting to the public what they wish to be known as. Hypocrisy is misrepresentation for the purpose of being seen a certain way. It is a theatrical display at odds with authenticity. With that clarification in mind, we can recognize how right with hypocrisy our world really is. Our whole political machinery thrives on putting forward a picture of oneself, often contrary to what one really thinks or believes. It's all about role playing. A figure might be just fine with a particular judge or nominee, but because they are on the other side, they have to play the role of opposition in order to gain the favor of their constituency. Nations too like to put up a front, pretending to be a people or place of peace and prosperity to shield their insecurity or faults. You even get the sense that in this immediate geopolitical drama, countries are acting in the same old roles with Russia as evil aggressor and, and the Western world as saviors. All the while, the Ukrainians stand by in need, not of our acting, but of our action. On an individual level, one might be welcoming toward people who are of an LGBTQ identity, but when they are with family or friends who are not, they go along with their slurs and throw in some themselves in order to show that they fit in or to keep the family peace. Of course, present family members who are LGBTQ overhear this all and remain fearful to be their authentic selves, playing a role that will keep them safe. Even here, one might show up for worship, don sackcloth and ashes, pray the prayers and sing the words, all in order to appear to be devout and dedicated, but all the while doing it to be seen a particular way by friends or the wider community. <clears throat> Hypocrisy is acting. It is playing a role that misrepresents who you are. And as we can see, it is not a victimless crime, as it furthers political division and prevents collaboration. It prioritizes family connection over the harm caused to people. It keeps us from living authentically as ourselves. Jesus is freeing us from this need to keep up appearances, from the desire to display our clean home, our righteous lives, or our faithful piety to others. Jesus is setting us free from the hypocrisy that causes us to play roles that are not who we are. Jesus is setting us free for an authentic life, restoring us to ourselves in a world that tries to have us act according to how we might be perceived. Jesus does this through challenging our religious impulses to perform for others, redirecting our giving, our praying, our fasting to God alone. Jesus gives us with a new goal that our heart might treasure, 
the heaven that is to be on earth. Throughout Lent, we are being challenged, we are being pushed to reconsider why we pray, why we gather here for worship, why we engage in acts of justice and care. Likewise, we are being gifted with a new focus for these things. God and the needs of our neighbors rather than the need of our neighbors and grace. On the way to the cross, that place where all the world's messiness and ugliness is revealed, have we come to see clearly how we have been hiding away all that clutter? We find ourselves becoming more free to be ourselves. And at that destination, cross and resurrection, we find in some way our authentic selves being restored to us. Finally able to play the role of ourselves for once. The ashes we are about to receive set us on the way to the world made anew by cross and resurrection, a world where all can be who they are. With those ashes, we are given a reminder of who we are, a visible reminder that we do not need to hide, a reminder that takes us back to the very beginning when God made us. We are gifted the memory that we are dust, dust that God thought it good to breathe the breath of life into, dust entirely beloved and cared for by God as we are with no need to portray ourselves in any other way, no need to play roles and act according to other scripts. May you come to discover a new on this Lenten way to the cross, that you have no need for the roles you have been acting, no need for the pretending that has prevented you from being fully yourselves. May you experience the safety and joy of a community where you can be yourself, May you know the freedom of not having to hide, not having to clean, not having to appear altogether. May authenticity come alive in your life, the gift of Jesus for you, be found throughout this season of reflection, and then when you at the cross an empty tomb, when God restores the world to itself, may we find ourselves restored. Hypocrites no longer but fully our beloved of God selves. Thanks be to God.
present Christ today with the whole church. We enter the time of remembering Jesus' passing over from death to life, and our life to Christ is renewed. We begin the 14th by acknowledging our need for repentance and for God's mercy. We are created to experience joy and communion with God, to love one another, and to live in harmony with creation. But our simple rebellion separates us from God, our neighbors, and creation so that we do not enjoy the light of our Creator intended. As disciples of Jesus, we are called to a discipline that contends against evil and resists whatever leads us away from love of God and neighbor. I invite you, therefore, to the discipline of Lent self examination and repentance, prayer and fasting. Sacrificial giving the works of love, strengthened by the gifts of word and sacrament. So let's continue our journey through these 40 days to the great three days of Jesus' death and resurrection. Most holy and merciful God, we confess to you and to one another before the whole company of heaven that we have sinned by our own fault, by our own fault, and by our own most merciful fault, and we have our own fault, and by what we have done to you, and to one another, and to one another, and to one another. We have not loved you with the whole heart, mind, and strength. We have not loved others as ourselves. We have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. And we have shut our ears to the call to serve as Christ served us. We have not been true to the mind of Christ. We have grieved the Holy Spirit. And our past unfaithfulness, the pride, envy, Hypocrisy and apathy that have infected our lives, we confess to you. And our self indulgent appetites and ways, and our exploitation of other people, we confess to you. And our negligence in prayer and worship, and our failure to share the faith that is in us, we confess to you. Our neglect of human need and suffering, and our indifference to injustice and cruelty, we confess to you. Our false judgments, our uncharitable thoughts toward our neighbors, and our prejudice and contempt for those who differ from us, we confess to you. Our waste and pollution of your creation, and our lack of concern for those who come after us, we confess to you. Amen. Restore us, O God, and let the angels depart from us. Hear us, O God, for your mercy. Station here and a station here. There is no need to line up, simply come forward when the spot has been here.
portion also about the work of your salvation. <laughs> By the cross and passion of your Son, our Savior, Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Keep us in eternal life. Amen. Drawn close to the heart of God, we offer these prayers for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Renew your church, O oh God, when we have drifted from our call to proclaim your repentance and to guide your people towards justice. Lead us back to you. Encourage believers who hold the church's doors open to those who have felt execute, excluded. Guide all leaders of the church and seminarians, especially Lars Anderson, now in his internship here. Merciful God. Yes. Renew your creation, O oh God. Transform parched places into water gardens and preserve every creature that awaits the arrival of spring. Turn each of us from practices of environmental exploitation to become responsible stewards of all you have made. Merciful God. Renew our civic life, O oh God. Teach those in authority to advocate for the liberation of all who are oppressed and grant them courage to make difficult decisions. Guide the nations of the world, especially Russia and Ukraine, into peace. Merciful God. Renew our lives, O God. Spare your people from diseases of the body, mind, or spirit and send healing to those overcome by illness or grief. We pray especially for Joe Sandino, Beverly Hoppy, Emily Claw, Philip Hedges, Marsha Pearson, Sonny Poling, Gary Williams, Cassie Lee, Grant Bowen, Katie Roper, Harry Birdseye Erickson, Tim Bell, Al Johnson, Jamie Decimo, Ann Olachek, Clyde Erickson, Sue Manley, Patty Pearson, Colleen Denny, Helene Williams, Roger Erickson, and those we name in our hearts. Restore to us the joy of your salvation, merciful God. Renew this congregation, O God. During these 40 days of Lent, confirm our sense of mission and expand our imagination for ministry. Deepen our faith, increase our love, and draw us into your unfolding work of healing and restoration. Merciful God. As we mark ashes on our foreheads, we give you praise, O God, for all the saints who died and yet are alive with you, especially John Wesley and Charles Wesley, whom we commemorate today. Receive us with them into your eternal embrace. Merciful God. Receive our prayer. Some prayers with real God on behalf of the world of need, for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
body, Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthens us and keeps us in his grace. Amen. Blessed Jesus in the sacrament, you have fed us with your body and blood of life. Now send us forth to bear your life giving hope to a world in need. Amen. You are children of God, anointed with the oil of gladness and strengthened for the journey. Almighty God, motherly, majestic, and mighty, bless you this day and always. Amen.